about systems thinking. Um, systems thinking is a term that's bandied about quite a lot and this is to uh, talk you through what it is and when would you use it and how do you use it. Sometimes when you keep trying to do something and it's not working and you keep trying harder and it's still not working, you need to start thinking differently about the problem. And it's not easy to think differently. Um, there's not always an immediate support from it. You have, might be the lone, <clears throat> the lone fish. Um, it can be seen as a challenge to the genuine efforts and investments in the issue and all the work that people have done so far. And sometimes you've been working so hard that to then be told that you've missed a point or been on the wrong page or just missed something uh, can be quite hard to hear. So it takes a little bit of courage to be the one that swims in the opposite direction, trying to look at things a bit differently. And systems changers are people who are um, able and willing to do that. So um, this is a really nice quote from Einstein, which um, about changing our patterns of thought and we'll not be able to solve the problems that we create it with our patterns of thought. So systems thinking is a way of thinking differently about complex environments. It's essentially a management discipline of thinking that examines linkages and interactions between different parts of a given system. And it works on the basis that it's those interactions and interrelationships between those parts which need to be understood in order for the system to work more effectively. So how would you describe complexity? Well, there are some characteristics um, that are familiar in complex situations. There's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of uncertainty about what's incurring and what other people require. And um, there's often a really rapid change, change in information, change in events, change in the context. And there's a degree of unpredictability that is inherent in the situation. Um, there's often uh, strong links to other problem areas that are also quite complex, so it becomes like really massive. And there can be this sense of being like totally overloaded or not in control. So in a simple system, um, if you chuck a stone at someone, uh, you sort of know by the weight and the way that you throw it, um, what's going to happen, it's sort of predictable. You chuck the stone and you've got a fair idea where it's going to land. Um, and look, obviously there's lots of physics, braking, distance, velocity, acceleration, etc. But um, it, it's pretty predictable. But in a complex system like uh, how a bird might fly, um, a bird, it's a complex system, it's totally unpredictable. You cannot predict the environmental changes um, that it's experiencing and what it's going to do. And organisations and systems are complex. Their interactions and feedback all leads to what we call as non-linear behaviour. It's just unpredictable. And this results in often in the opposite result to what you're trying to do. And when you're trying to control a complex system in a linear way, what you end up with are unintended consequences, often the exact opposite of what you set out to achieve. For example, um, a government policy to ensure that prisoners being released from prison would have accommodation um, meant that there was a real focus on making sure that the prisoners had somewhere to go straight to from prison and there was a focus on that um, on the sort of first night where are they going to go, they've got an address, they've got somewhere to stay but there wasn't any input into what they had in the longer term uh, because the targets that they were set was in making sure that they had somewhere to go to. Or um, the government did a policy in 1994 to take away uh, the local authorities' need to provide um, halting sites for travel gypsies and travellers around England. And the idea was that if they did this, they would reduce the cost to local authorities um, of these traveller sites. And what happened instead was that the travellers had nowhere to park, so they parked on the side of the road and they had no facilities there, so they ended up leaving a big mess and then the police had to come down and do loads of stuff to get them evicted and the council had to get them evicted and then social services were getting involved because there were young children at risk of um, not being able to access school or services. And so the cost of the local authority shot up uh, when the whole point uh, of the policy was to try and reduce the cost. So what you have is a sort of set of actions dealt with in a particular way uh, in a very sort of linear and simplistic way and you end up getting a, the opposite effect to what you want. So systems thinking, it, this is where systems thinking would come in. It's 
were it's a, a way of thinking that would be applied to complex, messy problems like um, what to do about traveller halting sites or giving prisoners somewhere to go when they're released from prison. Um, it's, a di- it's a way of looking at the problem um, and embracing the complexity and thinking about the complexity rather than trying to simplify it. When do you use systems thinking? When do you not use systems thinking? Well, it's a bit like when you have a fire, you need to know which extinguisher to use. Um, you, when you have a problem, you need to know which thinking to apply. So what we think about are um, two distinct types of problems. Um, one's a difficulty and one's a mess. A difficulty is everyone agrees what the problem is, everyone agrees what the solution is, and it's sort of bounded in terms of time, resources and people. So it can be really, really complicated, but predictable. Uh, Whereas a mess, um, no one agrees on what the problem is, um, no one agrees on what the solution would look like, and it can often be unbounded. So um, the amount of time, the resources, the number of people involved, and it can be really, really unpredictable. So when you've got a difficulty, you tend to want something a little bit more structured, a little bit more mechanistic in how you uh, approach it. Or if you've got um, uh, an emergency, you might just want to call the police in and a sort of command and control way of doing things. But when you've got a mess, which is a, a little bit more around nobody agreeing on what the problem is or what it should look like or who's involved or how many was, how much resources there are available or what's going to happen, you don't necessarily want to use a linear and mechanical way of thinking about it. You can't just break down uh, into small parts and then go, we'll do this or we'll put an intervention in there. You've got to sort of look at all the interconnections and that's where systems thinking is really appropriate. And when you're thinking about systems, uh, uh, a complex problem or a mess, it's both the rational and the emotional aspects are important uh, to comprehend and keep a hold of. So that's why it's good to be able to think about what's going on above and below the surface. So uh, difficulty, it's a little bit like this chainsaw. You can take it all apart and you need to know how things work and how they fit back together again. <clears throat> but a mess might be really, really complicated and might look Uh, like it's all sort of fits together but it might feel a bit more like this big entangled mess. So when you're in a big entangled mess and you're stuck and you just don't know what to do um, often the problem is not trying to get away out of it it's actually spotting that you're in a trap and there are a number of systems thinking tools which help escape uh, the mental trap by shifting your mode of thinking or shifting your perspective. So um, this looks like a zebra, but if you see the bigger picture, then you can see it's not a zebra. So when you've got a difficulty, the way that we describe thinking is reductionist. You want to break big problems into smaller and smaller and smaller problems and sort of line them all up and then work out what interventions you need to put in. But when they're all interconnected, you need to keep those interconnections you might just start to discard some detail and iterate up uh, to a level of abstraction, so abstract up so that the interconnections are all kept and, uh, but the detail is gone and then you can see the picture more clearly. And that shift is a, a shift that's called a shift from reductionism to holism. So just trying to see the whole picture. And the other thing you have to do is to go from a a positivist uh, perspective, which is just looking at things from your perspective, to a plural perspective. So really understanding what what the situation looks like from many different positions. So if you're trying to tackle neighborhood renewal um, or um, tackle, reduce the number of teenage pregnancies, there's no point in trying to think about it from the government's perspective and how much money it costs to look after young, uh, young parents or how much money it's going to cost to uh, increase policing in, in uh, a, lo- a lo- local neighbourhood. You've got to be able to think about it from all the different perspectives. What's the police's perspective? What's the community's perspective? What's the local council's perspective? You've got to be able to look at it from everyone's different perspective and see their perspectives as valid even though they're not shared with the way that you might see the world. 
And that's a shift to a sort of more pluralistic way of looking at things. And that's a real crux of systems thinking. Thank you.